Uh, joining us today are several speakers who are all members of New York Passive House, and I would like to thank Magnuson Architecture and Planning for being a New York Passive House sponsor. So without further ado, we have a lot to discuss today. I will hand it off to Patrick Fitzgerald from NYSERDA. Patrick, the stage is yours. Thank you, and, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure this morning to uh, be associated with this presentation by Magnuson. Um, they're going to be highlighting a number of projects that are recipients of support to uh, nice service programs, including uh, being awarded to a competitive um, and exclusive uh, buildings of excellence competition that targets multifamily and mixed use buildings. Um, they, they are in the um, unusual position of being the architect on, I believe, um, at least six, possibly seven awarded projects through the first two rounds of the Buildings of Excellence competition. I'll just mention um, the competition is targeting um, buildings that are con consistent with um, and their design. We're, we're, we're hoping to engage with projects in early schematic design to help support um, the evolution of design and changes to, to uh, achieve uh, carbon neutral or carbon neutral ready performance uh, associated with um, New York State's goals in, in conjunction with uh, uh, attractive buildings that are cost effective and replicable at scale. So um, I'm, I'm not going to take a lot of time talking about the competition, but I did want to highlight one aspect of the competition this morning um, to make sure that folks that have joined us are aware of what we're trying to do. We're trying to work with teams not only to highlight the solutions, the buildings that meet the lofty standards that we have expressed within the building of excellence, but we're looking for data sharing, information sharing from each of the awarded project teams. That's a cut above, above and beyond what is typical. Um, cost data is, is key, performance data is key. The projects that are awarded through the building of excellence competition, a few of them are just now reaching completion. Many of them are in design or in construction. So we're sharing cost and solutions related data um, on our website on a regular basis. I'll share that now. So the Building of Excellence competition is, is it's not only um, recognizing and awarding projects that are achieving the lofty goals, but again, information sharing. So our Building of Excellence web microsite has lots of information about the selected projects. But in this section here that I'm scrolling to, we have published cost data. Um, for projects that are awarded to the competition on the cost data. Um, we're trying to do our best to compare it to a baseline uh, reference so folks know what the incremental costs are, but the actual costs for projects that are being built to the standards we espouse. So a quick look at this cost data. You can see it's a very complex um, or comprehensive set of data that's available um, through uh, from early schematic design right through completion for all of the um, different uh, attributes of the building that folks will care about. And you can filter this cost data uh, a number of ways. There's graphics you can do and you can run through the filters. So I don't want to take a lot of time going over it, but I just wanted to share with everyone that this information is out there. And we really encourage you to go out um, and, and capture the data and learn from it. Um, so um, the last thing I'd like to mention is uh, with the Building of Excellence competition, we've gone through two rounds of soliciting proposals and, uh, and awards, and we expect to release a third round of the competition in very early 2022. So if you're not on the list for receiving information about the competition and you'd like to consider submitting to it in the future, um, visit that website, um, sign yourself up, and we'll be sure to share that information with you. Um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah and Sarah, if you want to talk about your projects and your teams, uh, thank you for asking me to join you this morning. It's great. Absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. So my name is Sarah Beyer. I'm Associate Principal and Director of Sustainability at MAP. And it is my honor and pleasure to be with um, five other of my, four other of my colleagues, um, Cami Altman, Rachel Simpson, Joe Moyer, and Julie Chu. MAP is a mission-driven firm, meaning we support the mission of our clients to provide health, healthy, safe, and affordable housing and create vibrant communities. Over the past 30 years, we have also worked to be an active part in the growth of sustainable, healthy, and energy-efficient architecture, which we believe is central to supporting our clients' missions. While the science and underlying concepts of sustainable development are often similar across our typology, 
Design goals and barriers to success can vary from project to project. Through the lens of our seven NYSERDA Buildings of Excellence winners, we will explore the different ways that healthy and low carbon strategies can be employed to address the various needs of clients and programs. We will also discuss how some current policy or market issues can be adjusted to ease the transition to these healthier buildings and how this work is resulting in a fundamental shift within our architecture itself. We are working to provide near net zero projects through a carbon comprehensive lens across our entire portfolio. We know they provide better quality of life for our residents, are more durable and efficient buildings for owners, and contribute to our collective societal requirements. We are tracking this effort, which you can see in this approximately 10 year plot of all of our projects source EUIs with our seven BOE projects highlighted. We see that our, these BOE projects are part of an industry-wide shift towards a healthier standard, which we believe will become the norm soon. We do see this trend as actually a shift towards healthier buildings, healthier for occupants, but also for the neighborhood, for those creating the materials in the buildings, and for the environment, which means a sustainable home for people. Here's a summary of some of the central pillars of our approach versus code minimum on the right. The key is that these principles work in tandem with each other. So if one element is not fully implemented, then the rest will either not work or not work as well. Therefore, resources spent on one will make others less costly to achieve. We view our buildings as a whole system working together in order to really take advantage of these co-benefits. These principles, including the design concepts of urban placemaking, biophilia, and interior spatial experience are critical to creating healthy buildings of excellence. In many ways in our area, affordable housing has been leading the way on many of these efforts, and now is the time for all typologies to capitalize on these strategies. As architects, we see a fundamental shift underway. The energy performance of our finished product must now meet new standards with predicted outcomes. We now have the proven tools and well understood scientific knowledge to deliver this performance, such as heat pumps and passive house building science. Today, we are leveraging the benefits of placing more effort on a robust enclosure to provide a healthy interior that requires less energy. Just as significant code changes occurred when society realized that business as usual wasn't enough. We are anticipating that passive house concepts such as air tightness and energy recovery ventilation to all habitable spaces may become baseline. So here are the seven projects we'll discuss and their EUIs without renewables and the typical certification that they're aiming for. We're gonna give a quick one minute summary of each building and then actually break the presentation into technical topics. And the associate in charge of the project will give highlights from each of those selected projects. Hi, so 2050, 2050 Grand Concourse, um, which uh, was a first round Buildings of Excellence winner is located at the Northeast corner of 2050 uh, of Grand Concourse and East Burnside in the Bronx. Uh, the building is a 13 story new construction building with a mix of supportive and family units, uh, which are all affordable. Uh, the building is about 86,000 square feet and about 10,000 of it will be the new headquarters for Unique People Services, who is the owner and operator of the building. Uh, the building is currently under construction and residents are anticipated to be moving in early summer 2022 and we are targeting LEED Platinum certification for this project. This is Ryan Gold Sr. providing 94 units, uh, 94 housing units of studios and one bedrooms for seniors in Bushwick. The owner is the nonprofit Los Sudes Southside United. And we have targeted FIAS 2015 energy requirements, and the design meets all of them except for the source energy requirement due to this being a very dense energy loaded building with smaller apartment sizes. We will have the quality control of a passive house as if we were certifying. We have just started construction and are currently excavating. The project has the potential to become all electric if we were if we are able to accept and add alternate to provide heat pump hot water. Uh, this is Linden Terrace 2, which is part of a three-phase development encompassing a full city block in Lindenwood, Brooklyn. The first phase is completed and was not actually part of the Buildings of Excellence competition. However, the second phase was winner in the first round. Um, 
It's an eight story, 160 unit, 100% affordable multifamily project with 30 studios set aside as supportive housing for formerly homeless adults. Um, so this building is fully electric and is currently in construction. Linden 3 is the third phase of that development and was a winner in the second round of the Buildings of Excellence competition. It is also eight stories, 100% uh, affordable family housing. It has 156 units, um, including 30 supportive units set aside for formerly homeless adults. So this project is also fully electric. Um, it is in construction documents with an anticipated closing this month in just a few weeks. Um, construction should begin shortly after the new year. This is DeKalb Commons, an affordable housing development for families, providing studios through three bedroom apartment sizes. It's comprised of two seven story buildings across the street from, the, from each other. The owner is St. Nick's Alliance in partnership with bed -Stuy Restoration. Our energy target is also FIAS 2015, but we should be able to certify given the unit density. The building will be all electric as well and we'll start construction early next year. Uh, so this is Cooper Park uh, Building 2. Uh, it is a BOE Round 2 winner that has been developed with the Hudson Companies and St. Nick's Alliance. Uh, the building is, uh, we are working on the building with our partner architects uh, architecture outfit, and it, it is uh, 18 stories uh, with 311 units of 100% affordable housing. Uh, currently, we're in the later stages of construction documents. Uh, the building's all electric. Um, with the exception of the required emergency generator and is planning to be uh, PHI certified and will reach a minimum level of lead gold. So this is the RISE, which is located in Brownsville, Brooklyn and being developed by Xenolith Partners. It's a seven story building with 72 dwelling units, both affordable and supportive with 13,000 square feet of community facility office space at the ground floor and cellar. This building is CMU block and precast plank with a brick facade. It's fully electric and going for our PHI certification for the residential portion of the building. We're currently in design phase and hoping to start construction next summer. So now we'll go into each technical topic for these low carbon buildings, starting with embodied carbon, then we'll get into the systems and then finally building enclosure and note about costs. As an industry, we are now truly addressing embodied carbon or, and discussing it more, which is imperative. The embodied carbon is a primary focus because minimizing emissions over the next nine years or so are critical to backing us off of climate tipping points. In a business as usual scenario, embodied carbon would account for half of new construction emissions by 2050. So here are the current strategies on the left side of the slide that we think about that we think about as a firm when we look to reduce a project's embodied carbon. Here are some of the material specification adjustments that we typically aim for, such as no foam plastic petroleum-based insulation. The SAN key diagram uh, is from DeKalb Commons, generated from the EC3 tool to help us track and analyze our embodied carbon strategies. We believe there's a lot of immediate low hanging fruit that we can target to reduce embodied carbon of our projects about 20 to 30% with, neg with negligible impact on costs. For DECAL, we studied the nine to 10 year timeframe very carefully and calculated the balances between material investment for operational carbon savings versus the embodied carbon spent upfront. We actually found, for example, that we didn't need to spend a large amount of embodied carbon on roof insulation as we had previously thought, because the additional amount, the additional amount saved very little operational energy. This is a good example of being able to rely on rules of thumb but allowing yourself the time to model and test them in your actual project parameters once you're far enough along, especially with the climate emergency in mind. Another strategy that works well is to speak directly with your suppliers and let them know you're interested in, in lower embodied carbon options. Many of them are getting ahead of the curve as a business strategy and are offering these at cost parity. We are using lighter weight blocks with lower embodied carbon on our upper floors at DECAL. We are finding that structural engineers for this project is KPFF are quite receptive to working with us on this. Another easy product swap is drywall. There are some better options out there that perform the same. 
This one weighs 20% less, so there should be savings in transportation costs and uses a high uh, recycled content. We're also really excited about the potential for this expanded glass gravel product to replace both our sub slab insulation layer and our gravel layer. Not only does it combine two functions into one product, but it also comes from 100% recycled material and has a low global warming potential. Where you're using this in more projects and even have a and even in the Rheingold project, uh, for example, where we have an SSDS system running through this layer. So on 2050 Grand Concourse, we took a, a close look at our building materials as well. And um, it can be a little more difficult in New York City to find affordable products that are also um, locally produced. Um, we were, however, able to get a decent recycled content for our metal framing and many of our finishes, for example. Um, the building is cast in place concrete, uh, so we were hoping to get a certain amount of recycled concrete aggregate, um, uh, which is, is becoming more uh, likely to get locally. Uh, but we quickly realized, though, that a lot more needs to go into this decision than just adding this into the specs. Due to budget and timing constraints on 2050, for example, we weren't able to get the ideal concrete mix to really make a difference. On the rise, however, I, I know that Julie's been working very closely with the team on the concrete design. Yes, so for the rise, we're spending time in our design phase to research replacing some of the cement in our concrete foundations with positive, which is recycled ground glass from the New York region. Our team, including the client, GC, structural engineer, we, we met with the manufacturer and had a really robust discussion. One benefit of using local recycled ground glass that came up is that fly ash and some of these alternative SCMs are currently experiencing a supply issue. However, there's only one or two concrete subs that have used this material in New York City and have an approved concrete mix with the DOB. Our GC is interested in working with their own sub and noted that there is a small upcharge to using this material, but it's not significant enough that they're pushing back. So we're currently working on a concrete mix with our structural engineer so that we will be able to submit the mix to DOB before we pull our construction permit. So now we'll dive into the building systems for these projects. Um, uh, electric, efficient electrification. We're putting uh, a, a lot of effort into advocating uh, for the use of only electric systems in our projects. This, of course, will help us take advantage of the renewable energy that is coming online, which you can see represented here uh, by New York State's plan for offshore wind. Uh, New York State expects the grid to be 100% renewable by 2040 at this point. Heat pump technology is the electric powered way to heat and cool. The equipment is around three times more efficient than fossil fueled fi fuel fired equipment will ever be. And this is because it is not gen generating heat, it's just simply moving existing heat energy around. And we've seen these systems used in other countries for years. Um, in the US, we're becoming friendlier with heat pump technology, and in our practice, it's become a standard. A few things, though, to consider in affordable housing and rental situation, situations is that the typical system will have combined or shared condensers on the roof and evaporator units in the living area. So it's important to discuss this with our clients at the beginning of the design phases um, uh, in, in speaking about their billing structure. Many of our clients are opting to subsidize the condensing, condensing costs while electric, the electric costs to run the fans and the apartments is covered in the residence electric bill, which is a minimal cost. Um, and this provides both then heating and cooling to the residents as opposed to just heating. Um, careful coordination of condensate lines is important as well as location of evaporators, typically wall mounted in our projects, but we're looking at other systems which um, Joe and Sarah will touch on. And finally, refrigerant management um, and, efficient, and efficiency is crucial. Again, on the rise, Julie's team was able to compare different layouts of refrigerant lines, that, which is pretty telling. So these are diagrams of the rise showing a horizontal versus vertical distribution of refrigerant lines. Refrigerant leaks is a big concern for embodied carbon and is common as site fitted connections, such as elbows, as the system ages. Refrigerant can have a global warming potential several thousand times more than carbon dioxide. So an example of the horizontal VRS system is a heat recovery system where two different residents on the same floor 
can be in heating and cooling mode at the same time. In the vertical VRF system on the right, we would zone by facades to accommodate the temperature swings during the spring and fall seasons. We believe we can achieve the same level of comfort as the heat pump system, at the same time, significantly reduce the amount of refrigerant lines for our building. Now, Joe will talk about how this will look on a much bigger building. Um, so since uh, Cooper Park is uh, an 18-story building, um, we're also using a vertical distribution uh, system zone per facade to provide that additional tenant control. The biggest difference comes uh, in the increased height, um, which needs, needs uh, more coordination with the risers for the VRF units. Um, on this building, uh, we're having to coordinate an extra two sets of risers um, uh, to set, so uh, riser sets for the upper, uh, middle, and lower zones of the building. And um, as the risers uh, go down the building, those risers are then uh, reduced as the supply is no longer needed. Uh, the other uh, change in this building is the floor mounted indoor VRF unit, uh, which was selected by the development team um, as an aesthetic because they felt it had a more residential feel, um, similar to a PTAC, but smaller. Uh, we also wanted to mention, although we are not using them on BOE projects, but other high performing projects in our office, that there are a few unitized heat pump package terminal units that are coming to our market. A unitized option means there are no refrigerant lines running throughout the building uh, between the apartment evaporators and the condensers on the roof. This means lower construction costs and lower carbon impacts. We are currently using them on uh, these uh, two new construction projects um, and reviewing them for retrofit. We see a huge potential for them in, the, in this retrofit market um, to replace old gas PTAX. However, we would really like to see more, more manufacturers get into this market. Now we'll touch upon um, how we provide ventilation, uh, the strategy for which is critical to a healthy and well-performing well building. Um, we're getting more data on how code minimum ventilation is not really providing true air changes of fresh air. An example of a dangerous result is CO2 buildup at night. The reality is even with current requirements for energy code um, air tightness, if you are not providing dedicated fresh air that is balanced between supply and exhaust, the building is not achieving real air changes. There's much higher risk for condensation issues and for unhealthy air, which is not providing me enough oxygen or flushing out toxins. Again, there are different ways to address this issue, and building codes are progressing towards mechanical ventilation being a requirement, just as, as sprinklers have become. Ventilation can be considered in a life, as a life safety issue in many ways if you think about the implication on health. And uh, Rachel will dive more into how her team addressed ventilation on Linden. Yes, actually, um, I would also like to note that uh, dedicated fresh air via energy recovery ventilation can also help with noise pollution, which is a real um, health and quality of life concern that we encounter with many of our affordable projects. So both Linden 2 and Linden 3 have uh, Little E designations for noise, meaning that we have to provide uh, window and wall assemblies with a certain um, OITC performance. And the ERV systems help to maintain that noise reduction with fresh filtered air, even uh, when the windows are closed. So it's a, it's a healthier, quieter environment in that sense too. So at both Linden 2 and 3, the owner preferred uh, unitized ERV equipment in each apartment shown here, rather than a vertical centralized system. Also, um, while we had, we do have um, adequate overhead height within the units to accommodate these smaller uh, branches of horizontal ductwork for the unitized system, we did not have um, available height for larger overhead transfers that are often required for a centralized system um, when they connect to the units at the rooftop. So um, we located these um, unitized ERV um, piece equipment in small enclosures within each apartment along the exterior facade uh, to minimize the insulated run of ductwork to the fresh air intake. Um, the more challenging piece of this unitized rather than centralized strategy has been coordinating through wall penetrations um, and maintaining adequate distance between the exhaust and fresh air intake louvers and operable windows. Um, so the other option for ERVs is a centralized system. 
Um, on Cooper Park, we are using the system, um, and the decision was initially made for the system based on aesthetics, um, the ability to remove the louvers from the facade, um, also um, gave us uh, the additional goal or helped in our additional goal of meeting passive house standards and reducing uh, penetrations. Uh, cost implication ra implications raised by the GC on board resulted in us doing an analysis of the cost to increase floor to floor heights so that horizontal ducts in a unitized system allowed sockets to have a minimum ceiling height of eight feet um, to provide the required habitable space below them. Moving the horizontal ducts and going with the centralized vertical system saved at least four inches, likely eight inches per floor on, on 13 floors, um, reducing cost of the building materials from structure, facade, um, finishes, et cetera. The result, however, like Rachel said, is the ceilings below the roof levels um, require much more space in a larger floor to floor height. Um, so uh, that can be an issue on projects um, when uh, dealing with zoning height limitations. Um, here you can see the mechanical plan for the 12th floor at Cooper. Uh, and on the left side, you can see the vertical risers continuing up six more floors to the roof um, in the tower portion. And then on the right, the duct offsets at that 12th floor ceiling um, combining and joining uh, before they uh, penetrate the roof to the equipment directly above. Thanks, Joe. Um, in our efforts uh, to provide all electric buildings, stoves are a critical energy and health system to electrify. Gas stoves used, uh, used to be the norm, but they pollute the indoor air to levels that are not even deemed safe by the EPA or for the outdoors at this point. Although um, in many projects, the traditional electric stove specification is um, electric resistance. In some of our projects, we are seeing our clients opting for induction stoves. Induction is inherently more efficient than your typical resistant coil electric stove because it focuses the heat directly on the pot or pan being used and therefore doesn't waste that heat. On some of our supportive residential projects, clients welcome the safety aspect of the induction system. The cooking surface does not get hot, which avoids burns and accidental fires. There is, however, perception that induction cooking is not as great as gas cooking. Um, and this is being debunked uh, uh, by prominent chefs all around the world today. It does, however, require that stainless steel, keros cast iron, and or enamel cookware, ferrous cookware, be used for the induction process to work. Uh, we have seen some owners uh, provide cookware to their residents upon moving in, uh, but at this point, these materials are widely available and economical. Uh, next, we're going to discuss domestic hot water provided with electric heat pump, syst heat pump systems. Uh, the technology is the most recent and really the final piece of the puzzle for us designing all electric buildings. Uh, despite the fact that the technology is relatively new, our typology at this scale more and more buildings are being implemented, are implementing this system to advance the projects to meet all electric goals. Uh, these systems can use refrigerants that have a lower global warming potential than the heat, heating and cooling VRF systems we, we talked about previously. Through our design process, we found a few lessons learned. First, it can be beneficial to separate the condensers and the um, storage tanks to alleviate structural loads. On Cooper Park, we have the equipment together on the roof as the building is cast in place concrete structure and um, has more flexibility in its design. However, Decalp Commons shown here in the diagram uh, is precast concrete or precast holocore concrete planks. Um, and moving the tanks to the cellar, reducing the weight on the roof made sense. Also, it's a good idea to insulate the piping between the equipment above code minimums. And lastly, plumbing piping layouts should be made as compact as possible. Rachel, on Linden 2, you're advancing the system in construction, right? Yes, yeah. And also um, one of the items to keep in mind for electrifying domestic hot water, as Joe mentioned, has been, um, well, it's, it's been accommodating the peak load actually. So this chart here shows a typical day's hot water use um, for a residential building. You have a big peak in the AM as folks are starting up their days, and then another 
peak later in the day as folks are you know, cooking meals and getting ready for bed. So most domestic hot water systems work um, kind of in real time to accommodate those peak loads. For example, uh, electric resistance, domestic hot water heating can respond almost instantaneously um, at the time of that peak demand. But heat pumps um, work, you know, they're, they're far more efficient than those electric resistance ones, but they work slowly over time and they don't really respond well to those uh, or instantaneously to those peak loads. So um, as Joe mentioned previously, uh, these systems do require hot water storage, um, a capacity big enough to accommodate that peak load. Um, the gray line here that we've added to this chart um, it represents the amount of heat um, in those storage tanks. So after that first peak load, the hot water is down, drawn down uh, pretty quickly. And then over the course of the day, the heat pumps um, the heat pump hot water heaters work to sort of recharge the heat for the next peak load. So in this way, the system works kind of like a hot water or a BTU battery. Um, even though the system has capacity for the peak demand, the energy use is spread out over the course of the day and night, which helps to reduce um, overloading the grid during those peak times, avoids any peak surcharges, and also reduces demand on the electrical grid at times of uh, peak electrical use, which tend to sort of coincide with these peak water loads also. So um, we, come, we, we become better grid citizens with this uh, battery strategy. Um, and adding in renewable energy helps with that offset even more. At Linden 2, we're taking advantage of free heat from the sun via solar thermal panels, um, which is being used to preheat the incoming water um, to the storage tanks and reduce the, um, the work that the heat pumps have to do. And this works during the day, even on somewhat cloudy days. Um, for Linden 3, in contrast, we're using photovoltaic panels instead of the solar thermal panels. So rather than collecting free heat in the form of BTUs uh, to preheat the hot water, we're collecting free energy in the form of kilowatts to offset the electrical use. Um, so the PV panels, much like the solar panels, offset electric usage during the daylight hours. I note that uh, when we started the design for Linden 2, we didn't know at the time of any other affordable projects that were pursuing heat pump hot water heaters. Um, the desire was there to go fully electric because of the potential gas moratorium and risk with new gas connections in the area there, but um, it may not have been possible to fully electrify the building so efficiently with heat pumps and these additional systems without you know, the assistance and, 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 at, and aid of the BOE award. However, in, you know, and that was two years ago, in the last two years, we've seen several more projects in our office and outside of the office investigating and actually designing in these systems, which are, are no longer in such a short period of time being considered this strange new untested technology. Um, you know, in addition to the domestic hot water system, laundry equipment is, is also an important consideration, one piece of that electrification puzzle. Uh, so typically, our affordable housing developer partners rent laundry equipment from a vendor who then also services them. So unfortunately, right now, there are no vendors that provide heat pump dryers. Uh, this is unfortunate because heat pump systems uh, would save us significant energy. Uh, on the decal project, for example, that needs a difference of 7,400 kilowatt hours a year. Uh, which is also a large number because uh, the electric resistance dryers produce a lot of internal heat gain that we have to then cool. Integrating solar panels is, is also an important part of building-wide electrification. It's, it's a good investment with excellent payback, and there are many incentive programs available to help subsidize installation costs. Also with local law 92 and 94 of 2019, um, we were introduced to sustainable roof zones, which require either PVs or green roofs on most areas of new roof construction. And although affordable housing is um, somewhat exempt in most cases, uh, solar feasibility studies are still required for many of our projects. And we find that um, PV panels are being more and more incorporated and are an important feature of these projects, such as at 2050 Grand Concourse. Thanks, yeah, as Rachel noted, most of our projects where we don't have uh, an occupiable roof take advantage of uh, uh, the, the roof service to incorporate solar power, which is typically used to uh, power our common the common areas of our buildings. Uh, and 2050 Grand Concourse, 
the, the panels are supported on a pergola as well as on uh, tilted planes and they um, will help power the community facility uh, part of the part of the building. Uh, we did have some wiggle room on 2050 Grand Concourse with our zoning height limits. So we were able to create, uh, to, to, have a certain, to have a certain number of panels on a pergola over one of our roof terraces, which will be occupiable, uh, accessible to residents. Um, this creates a nice shaded area. You can kind of see in this photo right here, um, although it's under construction, not being used yet, uh, um, that the shading uh, can help reduce uh, the heat gain on our roofs and of course uh, limit the the UV rays that could eventually damage your roofing system. But as also noted, the current New York City zoning has limitations uh, that can be counterproductive to our effort uh, to provide more renewable energy. And uh, Julie will talk about this a little bit more. So for the rise, we have uh, max maximized our building height at our roof level and also have an occupied main roof dedicated to an urban farm. So in the zoning resolution, if you install solar PVs more than four feet above your roof, you are limited to 25% of the uppermost roof area, which fortunately doesn't include the space above the bulkhead. So in the image, you can see we are maximizing the solar on our bulkhead and using the full 25% of the roof area, but there are remaining areas where more solar could be installed. So this is a zoning restriction that we see is in conflict with some of the current goals in the city. So Coop, this is a roof plan of Cooper Park and it was able to avoid these zoning issues um, because the building is a part of a large scale general development rezoning through the city's Euler process. Uh, the rezoning increased the available floor area but the large scale general development allowed for waivers in bulk height and setbacks requirements uh, beyond the upzoning to increase the allowable building envelope to um, allow solar to be included within the allowable envelope and therefore not be limited um, by the zoning's permitted obstruction language that limits it to 25% of the roof area. So we're able to have a much larger array. Um, okay, resiliency and backup power. Now we will discuss a little bit about this, um, these elements. Um, which is, we do, another challenge that we are encountering with the electrification of our residential buildings is the requirement for backup power for such buildings that are over 125 feet in height, which is code required. Um, the backup power is required for life safety elements in those buildings, such as elevator, fire pump, and emergency lighting. Unfortunately, right now, the easiest and most economical solution to meet this requirement is the provision of a generator, which is reliant on fossil fuels. Uh, we have looked into battery backup power, which could draw from our solar panel arrays, uh, but currently the amount of battery power that would be needed to accommodate uh, specifically the startup loads of elevators and fire pumps uh, would require far more space that is not typically available on our projects and be prohibitively expensive. Um, and even if uh, we, we voluntarily are, provide, are wanting to provide backup power in our lower buildings and our shorter buildings, um, as soon as we are introducing the idea, uh, the battery must accommodate those high startup loads as well. So economically, it still doesn't make sense. Um, economically, and of course, uh, the batteries would be too large to be able to accommodate um, those backup powers. Uh, we are, however, watching the trends in the technology and city policy closely um, to see where we can improve there. So like 2050, uh... Cooper Park also, as a large building, uh, requires an emergency backup generator. And through the Buildings of Excellence Award, the team is reviewing an option to add an automatic transfer switch to the emergency system that will allow additional non-required convenience electric loads um, to the generator without increasing the size of the generator. Uh, currently, the option uh, would add electrical outlets and heating and cooling to the double height entry lobby and lounge of the ground floor and would provide conditioned air and an opportunity to charge devices in a power outage. So we've um, spoken about all of the systems so far, which are important considerations for reductions in energy use and embodied carbon and to support occupant health um, and comfort. But the building enclosure works very closely in tandem um, with the systems to achieve those goals. 
your building enclosure must be tightly sealed and thermally robust so that all of the systems we just talked about can be right-sized and perform optimally. And Sarah and a few others are going to get into that a little bit more. Yeah, so um, to create a thermally robust passive house enclosure on Wrangold, uh, we're using thermally broken girts uh, that are, are fiber reinforced polymer. Um, the girts are spaced at intervals that coordinate with the insulation size, minimizing material waste and reducing construction time. And we're using mineral or stone wool, uh, which has one of the lowest embodied energy of insulation product choices uh, that's currently available to us for this size building here in New York City. And it is also non-combustible and rot resistant and can be used in this type of rain screen application. On 2050, they also use mineral wool, but a little bit different strategy. Yeah, in 2050, we use what they call a screw through system, which uh, which minimizes the uh, the amount of material, of course, um, is a little bit more difficult to to install, uh, but it is uh, it is much more economical. Um, and to, to help ease the installation of the air barrier and other critical components to that thermally robust uh, enclosure. Um, for the steel framed areas at Rheingold, uh, we set the steel back from the face of the structure a bit. This was a special consideration we had to review with the structural engineer uh, as the center line of the steel structure um, is no longer lined up with the CMU that you see on the parapet on the right. And in the left detail, the entire thing is set back a few inches. Um, so those important things to discuss early. For Cooper Parker, Partner Architects Architecture Outfit reviewed a number of brick detailing options in the rendered section. You can see the window surround brick detail that extends beyond the main face. However, the current iteration does the opposite and recesses the window surround as seen in the, the brick detail, jam detail. The base building facade is fairly standard with a, with a stud backup wall, air and vapor barrier continuous exterior insulation, air gap, and standard four inch brick reveal. However, at the window jam, the developer didn't want to see a metal trim cover for the insulation air gap and instead wanted the aesthetic of a more classic brick return. Based on the size of the building and its economy of scale, we, were able, we have been able to proceed with uh, the custom L-shaped brick for jams to allow us to avoid complications with supporting br lower bricks in, in the jam over the air insulation space below and provide continuous insulation to the window. Uh, Julie, you're working on a brick facade for the rise, right? Right, so at the rise to allow our wall insulation to extend as much as possible into the window opening, we are showing an extruded aluminum window surround that will be attached to our UPVC window and door front frames. Um, this detail also shows the standoff clips at, for our relieving angles at our steel beams. We do have steel beams in several locations because we have very large window and storefront openings to bring in abundant natural light into the units, offices, and amenity spaces in this building. In this detail, our standoff clip is bolted to an angle um, in our steel beam that's welded to stiffener plates every 30 inches. We've, we reviewed this detail with our GC to let them know that we will need to frame and sheath in these 30 inch increments to be able to provide a continuous surface for our air barrier. Lastly, we wanna point out the autoclave aerated concrete block at the base of our parapet wall. Um, this will connect the wall and roof insulation instead of wrapping the insulation around the entire parapet. Then zooming out, we have our terrace detail for the rise. We have three landscape terraces, each on separate levels to connect residents to outdoor green spaces. A majority of our residents are formerly incarcerated women and the terraces are part of trauma-informed design and biophilia. We are limited to a maximum building height of 75 feet here, which isn't much for a seven story building with lots of mechanical equipment and ductwork, as well as maximizing the height of our offices at the ground floor. We're only dropping the plank here 12 inches to keep the eight feet headroom for the uh, habitable space below. We had to switch from stone wall insulation at our exterior wall to HFO XPS insulation at the roof to achieve our R value of 50. We're also using an inverted roofing system here 
so that we don't have to taper the insulation to save on thickness of the total system. And then jumping down to our foundation detail, we're showing a high PSI thermal material at the base of our brick shelves to connect the below grade insulation with the above grade wall insulation. We're also inserting two inches of rigid mineral wool between the bottom of our slab and top of footing to minimize the thermal break at all our footings. The rigid mineral wool has a compressive strength of about 580 PSF and works for our project as we don't have a concrete structural slab. And then lastly, uh, our cellar and ground floor plans here show our community facility offices highlighted in yellow next to the residential portion of our building in white. Because we're only certifying the residential portion of the building, we're installing an air barrier mem membrane between these two spaces uh, that's represented in the red dash line that you see, so that when we test the residential portion of the building, it will be completely separated from the community facility. All of the, um, the topics we've been discussing are critical to creating healthy buildings. Um, and here are a few specific um, key points combining system and material choices. So one simple but impactful adjustment we have made to our specs is to ask for health product declarations or HPDs in all of our construction administration or contract administration submittals. So this encourages transparency, which is actually a serious barrier at the moment to choosing better products. Similar to the tr transparency now required via restaurant grade labels and building energy performance grades, or the way we label the ingredients in our food, uh, transparency can help enact change. So it's important to know the ingredients and makeup of our buildings and materials so that we can advocate for healthier materials. Of the 85,000 plus chemicals that we're familiar with in modern society, only about 200 or so um, have been tested for their toxicity, um, and only eight are regulated by the EPA. So the field of green chemistry is, is you know, a few decades old and is a revolutionary concept to business as usual. So as chemists test first if their inventions are safe before implementing them. So we're finding that these higher performing, higher quality projects are only a few percentage points higher in construction costs. To really demonstrate this, uh, for Rheingold, for example, we leveraged competition between GCs bidding on the project to price an alternate that would get us from a baseline project using the same systems, but an increase in the thermal enclosure, which allowed us to reduce the size of the mechanical unit condensers by 20%. The result was an average 1% increase, but a, but a significant operational energy savings. And it made the choice to go to passive house level performance a no brainer. Um, I also would maybe jump in and, and point out that for our affordable housing projects, that baseline um, that you mentioned, Sarah, is, is already higher because of the demands of our public financing process. Um, you know, we're, we're already performing higher than or, or better than the than a typical code compliant building. And our developer partners are, are now aware of the co-benefits of passive house and low carbon strategies to fit into their missions and operational goals. Um, since our affordable housing developers tend to hold onto their buildings um, a bit longer than a, than a for-profit developer, they're able to really reap the benefits of these energy saving measures um, and are pushing for ever better performance. So we found, out, we, we found then that the demand for better performance has already helped to shift the industry by normalizing a lot of those systems and strategies and reducing some of the, um, what we like to call novelty tax that you might encounter for newer or less known technologies. Um, and we're really optimistic that not only these projects, but the entire body of Buildings of Excellence projects will similarly push that curve even further towards um, low energy and low carbon strategies. Now we'll take questions if there are any. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for that presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat. I'll go ahead and read them off, um, starting from the top. So Kevin, you asked if the slides will be made available after the presentation. I know uh, this meeting is being recorded. The recording will be posted on the New York Passive House website, but I don't believe the slides will be shared. Um, however, Andreas, if you are still listening, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Manuel asks, is there any FDNY requirements for installing, installing batteries on the roof? Yes, there definitely are. Um, 
Beth DNY came out with a set of rules to help guide us in 2019. Um, there's extensive sort of commissioning requirements. There's someone designated to oversee the battery while it's in operation. Um, you need to provide a standpipe up to the roof. Um, your surroundings need to be non-combustible. I mean, assuming that the roof is a good location, um, which it usually is. So we're actually on our projects kind of trying to anticipate that and provide a, an open space for that to be installed in the future. Great, next question. Uh, what kind of analysis or cost subsidies lead to rooftop PV versus solar thermal water preheat? Um, I can jump in on that actually. Um, the sustainability consultant on this, um, and shout out to Bright Power for helping with this for buildings two and three, Linden two and three, um, did provide uh, analysis for both solar thermal and PVs. Um, in the case of Linden two, where we're using the solar thermal, it, it kind of came down to a, a, a cost benefit analysis of the various incentives available and in which ones were not available for this particular building. Um, that was a slightly different uh, calculation for, for building three. But what we're looking forward to in the data collection phase of these two projects is, is sort of, since they're so similarly sized and constructed, the, the, the real-time um, uh, performance comparison between the two. On the uh, Terrace Irma paver section, it appeared there was a perimeter insulated trim detail. Um, I think they may be referring to the high PSI thermal break material under our saddle. Um, it has an insulation value, but also is strong enough to support the uh, saddle. Great, thank you. Um, there are no more questions in the chat. Um, so I would like to thank everyone for, for joining today. And I'd like to thank our speakers and presenters um for joining as well uh, very inspiring learned a lot and um if there's no further questions then uh, i would like to let everyone have a good rest of the day and good rest of the week thank you so much for having us thank you yeah thank, thank you. you very much thanks everyone